Hello and welcome to my bathroom. This episode is brought to you by my friends at the Invisalign brand. Fun fact about me, I've always been a little self-conscious about my smile. My bottom teeth are kind of crooked and it makes it really difficult to floss sometimes. Plus, I'm in front of the camera almost every day filming my show, so I'm excited about my Invisalign treatment for my health and to look and feel my best. My experience so far has been really awesome. I just went into my orthodontist, he did some x-rays and 3D scans, and I got back my custom Invisalign Clear Liners fitted just for me. My plan is to wear them 24-7, even on camera. If you want to know more, you can go to Invisalign.com and check them out. Hey, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with Mark and Jeff, the co-founders of Iconic, a company that's just blowing up right now. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Guys, I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? So as far as, you know, the actual origin story of Iconic, in about 2015, uh, I discovered an artist. His name is Timmy Sneaks. Uh, I met him in Boston. He had never sold a piece of art before. And I gave a piece of art to Rob Kardashian. He posted on Instagram. And then Timmy's following started to blow up. And a week later, we sold a piece for $1,000. Fast forward to now, his pieces go up to $20,000. Huge celebrity clientele, uh, Kevin Hart, Scott Disick, a bunch of NBA basketball players. And through the years, I found that everyone that would email me couldn't afford the art. So then we dropped a limited edition art print, and we made a lot of money. So I was like, wow, there's a huge hole in the price point art business. And through that time, I've been working with Jeff for like seven, eight years, super talented uh, digital artist. And we're like, wow, we should start selling price point art. So... In 2016, we started, you know, just side hustle, drop shipping art, making a couple thousand dollars here and there. Uh, Black Friday, we made like 15 grand. And then I will for always, always remember February 27th of 2017, uh, we moved to a Shopify website and we started uh, doing paid advertisement. And that's when everything changed. It was March. Uh, we did six figures. And me, Jeff, and his 16-year-old brother, who we paid 25 or 50 cents to process yeah. each order. 50 cents. 50 cents. Um, actually did a couple million dollars, just us three together. Um, and then, you know, we made that decision to go full-time. And you fast forward to now, and it's, you know, a full-fledged company with employees, uh, some, some licenses. And, um, yeah, that's, that's the sh- story in short. So it sounds like you hit the ground running. You sort of bootstrapped your way. You found some instant success. But, like, did you have any experience with art before that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've been taking private art classes since I was like six or seven years old, yeah. and I've been selling my art. I think I started at age like nine or ten. Um, you know, I was in local art fairs, um, always in the art shows, you know, selling um, phone cases with art on it, like went before those phone cases. So I was always had like an entrepreneurial like art tendencies to me, but I didn't really know what it was and just doing out of passion. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, oh, I was like the art kid growing up, you know, and still am, I guess. So what did you two meet? Ooh, I'd it's... say eight years ago, I was yeah. uh, in New York city with a, with a girl and I don't even know why to this day, she was just like, I need to introduce you to my friend, Jeff Cole. He's a super talented artist. And me and Jeff actually worked, I don't know, maybe two, three years where we hadn't even met. We were just talking on Gmail chat yeah, and he day. was just contracted out. And uh, I had always known since the the second we started working together, he has the work ethic a second to none, his talent a second to none. And through the years, we had worked in companies together. And I just never really thought that, you know, we fully, you know, I was never fully utilized. I definitely thought he was not utilized. And it just got to a point where we kind of stumbled upon this. And we were just like, hey, you know, this is the one where we can really bet on ourselves. And, you know, our effort would directly correlate to the success of the company. And yeah, it's been probably eight years now, and yeah. he's basically like my brother, and I do the business, he does the art. Yeah, but Jeff, you're kind of modest when you're talking about you know, art fairs and the back of phone cases, but, and don't be so humble. Like, you're doing some major campaign work, or you're doing some major work for some major brands. Like, you cut your teeth on a lot of shoe business, right? Yeah, um, I do that in my free time. Um, started meshing you know, pop culture with uh, you know, hyped up sneaker culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I just saw that that was a really booming market on Instagram, which all the attention was at. Um, and that's actually how I started 
or we started the concept for Iconic was kind of off of meme culture and, you know, people sharing quotes on Instagram, tagging their friends. So Iconic was a tangible way for people to consume art. So humble. Yeah. Nike, Adidas, Jordan, all the top brands in the world, all the top sneaker brands in the world, <clears throat> Jeff works. And, and really creative stuff and stuff that's like way out there that you wouldn't, like no normal human could conceive. Like you have a very creative brain um, and you're super talented. I mean, it's it's... It's phenomenal is the right word, I think. Yeah, I think I'm just so, like I said, I've been doing this literally before I even could remember a thought. I was drawing and painting. So it's like, it's like walking to me. It's like you complimenting, oh, like, I like how you walk. I'm just like, I just, I walk all the time. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's no, it's like, a good point. And I think um, maybe that's something to underscore for the audience. It's like, you know, when you're really good at something, uh, you do kind of take it for granted a little bit, especially when you're outside looking in and it's just like, you know, <laughs> master like you know it's so young yeah. but uh and maybe it's another good question so do you think you know skills like this uh, what percentage of you think is you're born with it or and you learn it um well i think art and then selling your art is a huge difference i mean there's millions and millions of artists that just paint and kind of design what they want but they have no intent of what the market wants and i think growing up and maturing and just having the ability to draw and paint so well, I was like, all right, well, now what? You know, what's next? And that's, what does the market want? Like, how do I sell my artwork? And Yeah. Uh, maybe throw it to Mark and ask, you know, do you think entrepreneurs are born or made? I think they're born. Um, you know, as we mentioned before, I've never had a real job. Um, you couldn't pay me any amount of money to work for anybody else. Um, for me, in my life, I think the same with Jeff. Um, one of our pieces, it says, follow your passion. I think you have to do something you're passionate about and something that you can put a lot of effort into. Because for you to win in anything in business, you have to put an insane amount of time to beat your opponents. And I think people really get uh, mixed up between talent and skill. You could be an entrepreneur and you can have talent, but to have the skill to execute, you know, I am exponentially better at business than I was six months ago, than I was a year ago, than I was three years ago. So it takes a long time to really put in the time and the hours to become a skilled entrepreneur. Right on. Uh, there's a quote that Henry Ford gets credited with a lot. It's like, if I would have asked the people what they wanted, you know, the, the Ford Motor Company guy, right? If I would have asked the people what they wanted, they would have said, a faster horse. Oh. And yet, you know, he revolutionized, you know, the 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 way cars are made so they could be made faster, cheaper, stronger, better, you know, and more people could afford cars. Um, going back kind of what Jeff said, he's like, I saw a need in the market and I met the demand. Like, so how do you reconcile kind of like staying ahead of the curve, kind of like what Ford said, like, all right, we're going to be beyond what, we th what people are normally thinking about. We're going to create something that's mind-blowing and serving your market. How do, you, how do you reconcile that? I think for me, the one thing is just always staying one step ahead. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that we had first mover advantage, but um, given the distro channel of social media um, as like our main outlet, I truly believe that we were the first one with this price point to, to enter that market. Um, and for us, you know, there are other people that have come to the space, there are people that copy us. And for us, it's really this, we do this, and when they stop cop start copying us, we're off it. Yeah, you are uniquely you, and um, that's a good point. Um, and with Jeff's art, you know, with his imagination, his capabilities, I can see you guys going far. Let's zoom out a little bit. And for people who don't know what the iconic brand is, um, let's identify it. You know, what does it stand for? Who are you guys and what are you trying to be? Yeah, I mean, I think the inspirational element came kind of later. Um, not later, but it wasn't like the first thing we started with. Like I said, there was a couple of things I noticed on Instagram that people were tagging their friends on. It was, you know, inspirational quotes. It was like surreal photography, and then I forgot what else. Memes, yeah, of course, memes, and that was it. Everyone just tagged their friends, and they forget about it. You know, a second later, and I was like, "There's got to be a way to take these crude images and make them tangible. People, you know, can purchase and buy." So it started with just, "What do people want, and what are people liking?" And then it kind of developed as like us working really hard. Like, you know what? Like this inspirational stuff is kind of true to us because we're. I mean, we work. I mean, we work 15, you know, 14, 15 hours a day, and we're like, you know what? Like, we're actually living the life that we're portraying in our, in our artwork. How do you figure out how long to stay in your lane, right? Like, so if you have a Prince business and you're killing it, you know, 
millions of dollars, right? Um, you've had like your best year ever. How do you know not to go into t-shirts or mer other merchandise or whatever else you're thinking, you know, a sneaker brand would be sweet. Um, how do you know how long to stay in that lane? With everything we do, it's KPIs, key performance indicators. So we just follow the numbers and for now, that's everything is working as is. Um, we do have stuff kind of pipelined out and you know, if those numbers aren't going in the right direction, we can pull some levers. We have levers ready to pull right now. Like I could tell him to pull the levers right now. Um, so for us, I think, you know, we've kind of staked our claim as the leader in this canvas art space and we just want to further stake that claim. And there's just so much meat left on the bone. Like there's, you know, we just got some more licenses we're about to announce. We got the Scooter and Gary partnership. There's a lot of cool strategic partnerships about to be announced. So talk about that. So you're talking about Scooter Braun and Gary Vaynerchuk. What are you guys doing with those guys? They're, uh, they're strategic partners. So um, I guess with Gary, Gary reached out to Jeff to yeah. do his style guide and he did it. And we wanted to give value first, Gary 101. So we didn't charge him. And about six months later, I emailed the guy that made the intro and I was like, hey, we're disciples of Gary. Here's our last six months of revenue. Get us, get us a meeting. Screenshots me five minutes later, Gary will take a 15 minute meeting. That 15 minute meeting turned into an hour, yeah. and then he's like, I want you guys to fly to New York. Fly to New York a week later, and it was just electric. It's like kind of going back to what I said with the infectious energy. It was just, we were with him until 1.30 in the morning at a, at a music yeah, studio. My, my favorite stories of Gary, um, it was like 2 a.m., and me and Mark were with him all day, and we're like, dude, like, we gotta be up at 8 a.m. to go meet with the NBA. Like, we're just dead tired, you know, thinking about what we're gonna do tomorrow, and we're like, Gary, you know, we're out. You know, slap hands. He goes, oh, you guys are pulling a half day today <laughs> at 2 a.m. Yeah. So, like, you can tell, like, he was just attracted to our competitive nature, and um, he wants to be competitive, and he sees us as just that same energy, and it was just so funny. I think we're just so similar in so many ways. So, so if Gary's become one of your mentors, then um, what's some of the best advice he's given you so far? Micro speed and macro patience. Um, we work really hard every day. We're running really fast, but we're, you know, we understand the fact that we need to be patient and stuff doesn't happen overnight. So I think that because again, me and Jeff are super competitive and then just, you know, just a lot of like little micro stuff that like when we meet with him that it's like to be able to go to someone and like Gary has answers. Yeah. So but on the other side of the coin, then just thinking out loud, why not start a t-shirt business or an apparel business where you put those images on a t-shirt. What's the harm in doing that? Uh, I mean, I think streetwear in general is just a flooded market and so was the t-shirt business and we thought about that but we're like, but no one's really doing canvas. Like, name a place you'd buy art. And everyone's like, I don't know, I just Google, you know, art for my apartment. And that's just where it started. It was just, and I started printing my artwork and just putting it all over my apartment just for fun. Yeah, but you don't have to just be a one trick pony, right? You, you've yeah. already got a, kind of got that on autopilot. And there's efficiencies to take that same image or that same saying and just, you know, copy paste over onto a t-shirt design, right? You, you don't even have to manufacture the t-shirt. So I'm just, I'm sort of arguing out loud, like, what's the harm in doing that? Maybe you... Let's just, let's just say yeah. that that's something that could definitely happen for yeah. sure. It's just my thing is kind of what I said before. There's just so much meat left on the potato that for me, um, it kind of, it, it's a Gary thing as well. Go narrow and deep, mm -hmm. not wide and shallow. So for us, like we want to be the unquestionable number one best art canvas company in the world. And, you know, we have, you know, 240,000 on Instagram and whatever it is, I want the whole world to know that. Yeah. And we are not going to stop until the whole world knows that we are the best. What mistakes have you made? You know, people watch this show because they want to learn from people who've been there and done that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is you can't have success without failures. Yeah. So where have you gone wrong mm -hmm. in order to get it right? I think first is uh, the numbers. Um, so yeah. things started really fast and I'm going to be frank with you. I had never been as successful as we were with this. So it just was just more and more. And we just became addicted to it where we were just all nighters, just go, 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 go. And we didn't really understand. And then as the market became more saturated and there was more competition, you have to understand every part of your business. So, so I just want to make sure, cause Mark said, you know, we messed up on the numbers or like, you know, getting focused on the numbers. But what do you mean by that? What, what was the mistake? 
Um, I think the mistake was just not understanding, you know, the cost to acquire a customer, what the average lifetime value was. Like, we could have scaled harder in the beginning, and then there would not even be a game. It's game over. So I think just not understanding in the beginning, you know, what it was like, what the climate was like, where we could have scaled really quick is big. Um, and then just, you know, just silly stuff like not being super organized and then you have to go back and organize everything. Um, you know, understanding, you know, accounting and understanding all that stuff um, is just stuff that we went on a big scale very fast. So it happened really quick. And like, you know, if I could start all over, it just would be just being super, like we're really organized now. But like in the beginning, it was, in the beginning, we needed to sign up for the website, a tax ID number. So we use my personal tax ID number. So it was my personal tax ID number. We didn't even have paperwork for the first yeah. couple million dollars. It was just Jeff, me, Jeff, going off my word. And I remember his parents were like bugging out, like, how well do you know this guy mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So like things just escalated so quick. And then it's, you have to stop and, you know, understand the numbers of the infrastructure before you can get to the next level. Yeah. So how big a company are you right now? There's the two of you plus... So there's, we have a digital team, we have a production team. Um, I do the, you know, the business, Jeff does the digital, uh, the art, and then we have a project manager, and then we have two full-time video and photo guys. So are you under 10 or? Under 10. Oh yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to give the viewers some context. You yeah. said, you know, digital team, you know, uh, production team Shout is Austin, Austin. Austin <laughs> one is guy. Yeah. So you're still, you're tr still trying to do a lot with a little. I firmly believe that we can do $100 million with like 10 people and then production and digital marketing. Because for us, you know, Jeff, Jeff is an alien from another planet and I've worked with other designers. He actually ruined it for me for life. So Jeff is like, we have our own design team. Uh, I have a pretty insane work ethic. And then from a content perspective, you know, we have Austin and Jake and we are going to build out the team through them. So I mm -hmm. see, you know, the majority of that, uh, the majority of our team growing is going to be the content department. And then digit, our digital team is, you know, we're growing layers on that. But we can stay fairly, fairly lean. I mean, in our office every day is four people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you and Jeff Bezos have the same idea. He said something like, your team shouldn't be larger than, you know, can, you can order a couple pizzas and feed your team. Yeah. Um, keep it lean and mean. I've heard that one. Yeah, I like that. You're in good company. Yeah. You're on the right track. Yeah, that's definitely a good company. So what else has gone wrong? Um, and maybe let's let's go back in the timeline just a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. before Iconic, because you've had, sounds like nothing but success, but let's go back maybe one phase or two phases. We were talking off camera yeah. about some of your other ventures that didn't oh. go quite so right. And again, the reason I ask this is because, again, the people who watch this, whether they're aspiring entrepreneurs, they're working for the man right now, and they're like, oh man, I wish I was marking and, and Jeff right now. It's like, this is where I want to be. But the reality is you've got to grind through some of the tough stuff, some of the yeah. failures to really get to where you are, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go back just a couple of steps where you were before this thing took off and talk about that life. I had an insane amount of failures. You, said, you mentioned successes, there was tons of failures in there. I mean, I could just go, I'll give you a two-year snippet, and I'll, I'll give you a couple fair or three-year snippet. So just and, and while you're talking, I'm going to imagine Jeff, like at these art fairs, you know, painting faces, <laughs> <laughs> like butterflies on faces, and like it, you and know bedazzling like, yeah. the oh. back of um, iPhone cases, <laughs> paying his dues. So carry on. Yeah. So <laughs> I was 22. And I had made uh, a lot of money in college because I was just a hustler entrepreneur. And I remember my buddy was living in California. I'm from New York. And he's like, hey, my company uh, needs a lead certified individual. It's leadership in energy and environmental design. This was, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years ago. This is when the green movement was going on. It was huge. So I did terrible in school. 2.1 GPA, five years. Did not care about school at all, but I was an entrepreneur in, in college. So I did terrible tests. So I was like, hey. I want to move to California. I'm going to study for this test. So I study for the test. I fail. I can't take it for two months. I study again. I fail. I study again, and I finally pass. So six months of my life, I'm studying for this test. Then I move to California. So happy. I sign a lease. A week later, I get fired. So I come to California, waste six months of my life, and I get fired. And I'm leadership. I'm lead certified, which what even is that? 
And then for a year, I worked for a company doing door-to-door -door sales in, from Beverly Hills to Compton to the Inland Empire. Zero salary, all commission. And there would be days that I would drive 200, 300 miles, Inland Empire, comp all over the place, in my suit, and I would make no money. I once went probably two, two three months with making no money. So I mean, that was just in like a two-year window of me just eating dirt. Um, and then my next venture, I built for nine months. We got an LOI, a letter of intent to raise money. And my partner went away and he passed away. So I mean, I just went through just years of just hardships and kind of like what you said, I think that the experience, I would not be who I am today, I would not be successful I am today if I, I think about those moments often. I will always remember, I, I, I embrace the struggle because those moments, I just, I, I just remember, just, it, it teaches you perseverance. And for me, there's nothing that will stop me now. Nothing will stop me now because I just know I've been through so much shit. So that's a couple failures. Yeah, so it's a great story. And I, I really think with adversity, it can fall on either side of the fence, right? Adversity can either, like Nietzsche said, you know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. Or it can crush you, and you're done. So, how did you dig deep? How did you how did you make it through that? How do you? Um, what were some of the things that got you through some of those tough times? I think for me, uh, I'm a very, very prideful person. I'm very close to my family. Uh, my father was successful. I was a successful soccer player. I was a successful entrepreneur in college, and then I came to California, and then just everything became crashing down. And I just knew deep down inside that I was just, I had the talent and I also was starting to develop the skill that I just knew that I just had to find that, that right thing. Like how I mentioned, finding the passion and the effort. I just had to find something that I wake up every day early and I am exploding out of bed. I am super excited. Austin comes running into the office. He's excited. Jeff's excited. Like we just, it's just finding the right thing. And like yeah. for me, it was just finding the right thing and now we found it and now like we joke all the time that like every day is my birthday like every day is the best day so i think it's finding it yeah so what you're talking about is patience yeah, and, sure. and you're also talking about perseverance tenacity mm -hmm. those are good those are good things to remember when i was in college you know doing my thing um our house got taken away and my dad got taken away and that really woke me up because, you know, I had no money. I mean, in college, you don't really have any money. You know, I, I probably had like 20 bucks in my bank account. So I had to start selling everything I had um, just to afford a computer. Because like, like I said, I didn't do any digital art. And I knew that drawing and painting wasn't going to, you know, pay the bills at that moment in my life. So I started selling everything I could. You know, I started, I sold my Michael Jordan basketball that was signed, which is very dear to me. It's just things that you would never imagine you would need to sell. How old were you at the time? I was, I think, 21. Okay. 21, yeah. So that day after that happened, I sold everything, and it almost just turned on a switch that, like, light, it almost taught me that life is binary. I could either, you know, cry about it and, and kind of weep and basically say, you know, well, shit, you know, this happened, um, or I could you know, go forward and, you know, just do everything in my power to take what I'm good at and what I love and just explode. And I think that's where my work ethic came from, from that day. So well, maybe I'll ask you both this, but I want to ask Mark first. What are you afraid of? Like, so you're having tremendous success. Yep. What's keeping you up at night? Nothing. I love life. I'm well, not afraid of anything right now. You know why? Serious? Serious. I'm not afraid of anything right now. Honestly, it's, it's, we are controlling our own destiny. If we fail, it is my fault. It's Jeff's fault too, but I would say it's my fault just because I'm handling kind of like the business side of it. This is what I've wanted my whole life. I've always been in a position where I've been the number two or the number three and I haven't agreed with the guys that are running the company. There's no excuses now. It's shut up and win. So for me, I'm not afraid of anything at this point. Um, I think, you know, we've, you know, we've been financially successful thus far we've had a you know a, a, i consider it a small win it's a, we are very ambitious guys but um i'm not afraid of anything i'm enjoying the ride i think it's gotten to a place now where p 
people are like, you know, would you sell the company or, you know, take out money and all this stuff. And for us, it's like, I am loving every day where we live through the company. So like, I couldn't ask for anything else right now. So I'm not afraid of anything. Well, let me ask you for some context. So then let's go back to the days when you weren't loving it every day. Yep. Are you loving it now and you're not afraid of anything because you have some financial stability? You got money in the bank and you're like, you know, listen, I'm untouchable. I can make my own decisions. Is that what it is? It's control. We're in control every day yeah. we wake up. We, it's, it's on us. So the success is on us. The failure is on us. And just being in control, you're just not afraid of it because someone else isn't controlling your destiny and not being able to do what you want and not being able to control the outcome is scary. Right. But uh, yeah. And not knowing, I agree, though. not knowing where, where you're, how you're going to pay rent next month too is a little scary too. Like, so is that, is that confidence yes. come with <clears throat> what's in the bank account right now? I, um, <clears throat> I definitely think that that has something to do with that. I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it doesn't. Yeah. Having that backbone is great. Um, but again, it goes back to the passion and effort thing that like, we're working so hard. And it's not like the more we get, like, oh, we're like resting on our laurel, laurels. Like, we just signed that deal with Gary and Scooter. I wanna prove them right. So I'm gonna go harder now. Yeah. Like, and I'm confident in my team too. I love my team. I'll take my team against anybody. Uh, the point I wanna make is, and what I wanna talk about a little bit, is, is this confidence thing. So it's like, now that you feel invincible to a certain point, now that you feel like I'm not afraid of anything, you've got money there, like are you being careful and cautious with it? Zero money raised, zero debt, yeah. and we didn't take a dime for a long time. We're not even paying ourselves now. That's what I'm getting at, I guess, when I ask, what are you afraid of? Because like, are you afraid of that money going away and it goes back to ground zero? Or are you like, no, we're on a good trend, I'm not afraid because I think that we're self-aware enough with ourselves personally and the market that kind of what you touched on before, like, we'll pivot. If it's not working, we're going to pivot. I'm not like, we have to do this and we are not changing. If something says, hey, this does not make sense, we're self-aware enough that says, hey, we can tweak it. Because I think that we have enough um, talent and skill on our team that there's, there's a million different pivots we can go. I mean, you've mentioned five. I spoke to the first 4,500 customers, Brian. 4,500 customers I spoke to. So do you, do you know what that does? When you speak to all of these people, it becomes, oh, hey, I spoke to the owner. It's, it, and then it just starts compounding. So like that was, I think, um, we were so deep in the trenches in the beginning because we were like, what is this? How is this happening? That it was just... I think that we, the, the brand started on the right foot uh, as far as that goes, and that's where I get like my confidence from.